Thank you. That concludes general questions. The next item of business is First Minister's questions. And at question number one, I call Douglas Ross. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And can I remind the Chamber of my register of members' interests? My wife is a sergeant with Police Scotland. November will mark 20 years since Alistair Wilson was murdered on the doorstep of his home in Nairn. For two decades, the killer has never been caught. Alistair's family have spoken with the Press and Journal and raised serious concerns about Police Scotland and Chief Constable Joe Farrell. Andrew Wilson was four when his father was murdered, and this week he said this. We question why our family is still being kept in the dark while Joe Farrell is basking in the media spotlight as she talks of building bridges and providing confidence to our family. Andrew continued, we don't know whether Joe Farrell has been confused or perhaps even caught in a lie, but she has certainly failed to reassure us that she has a grip on the worsening situation. Alistair Wilson's family described the conduct of the Chief Constable as insulting and callous. So does the First Minister agree with the family of Alistair Wilson? First Minister. President Officer, this is obviously an incredibly sensitive case and the first thing I want to say is to express um, my sympathy to the Wilson family at the tragedy they suffered almost 20 years ago and uh, to share their frustration that this case has not been resolved. Mr Ross will know that there has been um, extensive intervention and investigation to try to identify who was responsible for the murder of Alistair Wilson and I welcome very much the fact that the Lord Advocate, who as Mr Ross again will understand, is the independent head of the prosecution service, has instructed that a fresh investigation be undertaken of this case. The point that Mr Ross puts to me about the actions of the Chief Constable, uh, again the, Mr Ross will appreciate that the police operate with uh, absolute operational independence from the government. It would be inappropriate of me to indicate any opinion on the uh, stance taken by the Chief Constable. It is a matter for the Chief Constable to, uh, to address and um, certainly the First Minister should not be indicating to the, First to the Chief Constable what actions she should take in relation to a live investigation. Douglas Ross. My question, because I, I know the situation uh, very well, my question was not asking about the live police investigation. It's asking about the comments of a family this week, a family still grieving the loss in horrific circumstances. And the response from Police Scotland following the decision by the Lord Advocate is one that clearly falls below any standard we should expect, particularly from the Chief Constable of Police Scotland. So I hope the First Minister will at least reflect on that language, insulting and callous. The Chief Constable is being described by a grieving family as callous. And I hope the First Minister will reflect on that and seek to address what could happen, because this case has been unso unsolved for two decades, but it's also spanned several chief constables and several government ministers. The Wilson family have raised concerns about the current chief constable's handling of the case, but the Scottish Government are not powerless in this situation. Indeed, the First Minister has previously spoken about ongoing police investigations in his own constituency. So can I ask the First Minister, if he or his Justice Secretary have spoken with the family of Alistair Wilson about their significant concerns, and if so, what has been done to address these? First Minister. Uh, President Officer, I, 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 I don't want in any way to, um, uh, to create any sense that I am not sympathetic and empathetic to the situation in which the Wilson family find themselves. Uh, uh, Alistair Wilson was, was murdered on his own doorstep. Um, his killer, uh, killers have not been brought to justice and that deeply concerns me. I think it is important that I place on the record that Police Scotland have had formidable success in resolving cases of murder, um, of uh, some of them long in the past, because of the improvement in investigative procedures and practices and that has resulted in a number of people being brought to justice who had um, 
remained uh, uh, with freedom, having, convicted, uh, having been uh, committed some of the worst crimes imaginable in our society. So Police Scotland does focus on resolving these matters, and that's why I said in my first answer that I welcome the instruction from the Lord Advocate for a further investigation of this case. Now, neither I nor the Justice Secretary have spoken to the Wilson family about their concerns. And I think it's, um, Mr Ross raises the fact that I've expressed points in relation to previous cases in my own constituency. I did that respectfully when I was on the backbenches. I was not First Minister. It's a very different matter when the First Minister starts commenting on live cases. And I think I need to avoid doing that for the sake of protecting the constitutional separation of responsibility for operational matters with Police Scotland. But um, I would say to Mr Ross, I have every sympathy with the Wilson family and um, I hope that the actions that the Lord Advocate is taking and which have been pursued now by Police Scotland will provide a resolution to the deep concerns that the family has. Douglas Ross. In December last year, the Wilson family complained to the Police Investigation and Review Commissioner about the handling of the police investigation. But looking at this more widely uh, across the country, the current system of complete, uh, police complaints was set up by the SNP government when they centralised Scotland's police forces back in 2013. And as the experience of the Wilson family shows, it's clear that the current system is not fit for purpose. The police bill that's currently before Parliament aims to address these feelings, but there are still areas where it falls short. Just yesterday, His Majesty's Inspector of Constabulary in Scotland called for an amendment to the bill which would allow officers who face criminal charges uh, to face criminal charges if they abuse their position. Uh, I agree with that, and I can confirm that Scottish Conservatives have lodged an amendment which would add this provision to the police bill when it goes to committee next week. So will the First Minister back the inspector's calls and support our Scottish Conservative amendment to ensure that any police officers who abuse their position are held to account? First Minister. Presiding officer, um, I have a great deal of sympathy with the point that Mr Ross has raised with me today, and ministers will look carefully at the amendment that comes forward for stage two, because part of the work, the, part of the, well, the purpose of the Police Ethics Conduct and Scrutiny Bill, which um, I actually began some scrutiny of when I was on the back benches in the Criminal Justice Committee, um, it is coming to stage two proceedings in Parliament. It's been supported at stage one, uh, stage two at committee. It's been supported by Parliament at stage one. The issues that um, His Majesty's Inspector of Constabulary raised in the proposal have not been the subject of consultation as part of the preparation of the bill. So that's an issue which we have to be mindful of in considering the amendments that come forward, because obviously Parliament does prefer to ensure that issues are the subject of consultation. But having said that, I am sympathetic to the point that Douglas Ross raises, because I do want to ensure that the Police Investigation and Review Commissioner is actually able to undertake the type of functions that I think both Mr Ross and I would want to, uh, them to undertake. And that has to be effective, it has to be transparent, it has to be challenging. And as the bill takes its passage through Parliament, I give Mr Ross the assurance that ministers will look carefully and consider carefully any proposals that will work to strengthen that test that I've put to Parliament today. Douglas Ross because our amendment does strengthen the bill and it does fill uh, a void that even HMIC have recognised. Uh, but the truth is, presiding officer, that while Police Scotland may have let down the Wilson family, this government have been letting down police officers and the communities they serve right across Scotland. Officer numbers are now at their lowest level here in Scotland for 17 years. The SNP used to promise that they would put 1,000 additional officers on Scotland's streets, but numbers are now down by 1,200 compared to when the SNP created Police Scotland a decade ago. The number of major investigation team DIs, which investigate the most serious crimes, including murders like those of Alistair Wilson, are down by a third. And Police Scotland are so stretched, they are no longer able to investigate every crime. Quite frankly, the SNP have left our police to fight crime with one hand tied behind their back, and the results are clear. 
violent crime at its highest level in a decade, and our prisons so overwhelmed that SNP ministers have been forced to release prisoners en masse. So can I ask the First Minister, does he agree with his deputy, Kate Forbes, who said that under the SNP, policing has been stretched to breaking point? First Minister. Officer, I think I have to put on the record the fact that uh, levels of crime in Scotland are currently at 40-year lows. 40-year lows. And that's a tribute to the work of police officers focusing on the tackling of crime in localities. Now, I accept that police numbers have fallen. There's, uh, the last um, census at the end of June, they were sitting at 16,207. And that is lower than the government expected, given that we had given the police record funding of £1.55 billion. Now, I expect those numbers to increase and the for, in the next census for those numbers to increase. So there should be some reassurance to Mr Ross that police numbers are strengthening as a consequence of the uh, significant levels of recruitment that the Chief Constable and Police Scotland are undertaking at the present moment. Now, there is an inherent contradiction in Mr Ross's question to me that his accusation is that crime is not being pursued, but the prisons are full. Well, if the, if, if the prisons are full, that suggests to me that crime is being pursued and more individuals are being convicted and imprisoned. Let's hear the First Minister. So, uh, I, would, I would respectfully say to Mr Ross, that there are challenges in relation to the work of Police Scotland. Police Scotland will make the necessary steps to investigate crimes where there is evidence to do so, and that people will be convicted, uh, will, be, uh, will be prosecuted where there is a case to do so. That is what we would expect, and that is what we would expect in a system where we have a 40-year low of crime as a consequence of this government's stewardship of police resources in Scotland. Question number two, Anna Sarwar. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Figures published this week have revealed the extent of the homelessness crisis in Scotland. On this SNP Government's watch, 40,685 homelessness applications were recorded last year. That is the highest in a decade. And as of March 31st this year, there were almost 32,000 live homelessness applications. Every number is a human being in need of desperate help and support. But this SNP government is failing them. In the face of this homelessness crisis, this parliament shamed the government into declaring a housing emergency earlier this year. But despite that, the housing minister, Paul McLennan, insists this government has a good track record on tackling homelessness a decade high. So can I ask the First Minister, is there a housing emergency or not? First Minister. So, yes, there is a housing emergency. Uh, the government recognises that, and the government is taking action to remedy the uh, housing emergency. There is a range of action that is being undertaken to ensure that we improve the position on the availability of accommodation through tackling the issue of voids. Uh, there is further work being undertaken to strengthen investment in the deliver the construction of new homes and the refurbishment of existing homes to be available for rent. And there are steps being taken in the planning system to ensure that we can take the steps to tackle the housing emergency. So the government is absolutely focused on building on its strong record of house construction to tackle the challenges that we face. Anna Sarwar. I welcome that the First Minister recognises a housing emergency, but the broader answer demonstrates a government with its head in the sand and oblivious to the struggles of thousands of Scots facing homelessness as we speak. Let's look at the facts. Under this SNP government, we have the lowest levels of home building by housing associations since Thatcher. Overall house building is down by 17% and the affordable home building target is in tatters. And we now shamefully have record levels of children in temporary accommodation without a home to call their own. That is over 10,000 children left homeless on this government's watch. And the number of young people living in B&Bs has soared in just the last three years by over 900 per cent. So, First Minister, with record levels of homelessness and you now agreeing with the declared housing emergency, will you change course or will you back your out-of-touch housing minister? Uh, First Minister, I, I would be grateful, Mr Sarwar, if you could speak through the chair. First Minister. 
President, sir, um, Mr Sarwar challenges me on the government's record and he just talked about facts. So allow me to share some facts with Parliament. Between uh, 2007 and 2024, this government was responsible for the construction of an average of 7,750 affordable homes each year. And during that period, we endured the financial crash mm -hmm. and uh, 14 years of austerity under the last Conservative government. And of course, we have the, uh, the prolonging of austerity under the new Labour government. Now, between 1999 and 2007, when Mr Sarwar's party were in charge of the Scottish Government and Jackie Bailey was, for a short period, a minister in that government, the Labour Government, when money was so flush that they left money in the Treasury kitty unspent, there was an average of 5,448 affordable homes. Now, just so that everybody hears that clearly, at a time of plenty, when the money couldn't literally be spent in time, an average of 5,448 homes were delivered each year by the Labour Party. Under this government, it's 7,750 homes, so we're getting on with the job. Yeah. And a officer, the First Minister wants to talk about at a time when I was 16 years old, not a time when 10,000 children are homeless in Scotland right now under this government's watch. And it's the devastating consequence of what he himself admitted was a government too focused on what they can't do than what they can do. Scots left to pay the price for an SNP government that's lost its way, is incompetent government and is bad with people's money. Housing in Scotland is completely the responsibility of this SNP government. But after 17 years, when will they take responsibility rather than always looking for someone else to blame? For the Housing Minister to claim they have a proven track record on tackling homelessness when it is at record levels is not just inept, it's shameful. So Paul McLennan simply cannot continue. So will the First Minister recognise that he has a choice? put up with more failure or get to grips with a housing emergency, sack this housing minister and change direction. First Minister. I would just point out to Parliament that, as usual, Anna Sarwar, when he's faced with facts that rebut his argument, always plays the man and not the issue. It's what Anna Sarwar always does. So let me just come back, let me just come back to the facts. When this, under this government, and I'm not evading our responsibility, under this government, we have built on average 7,750 affordable homes each year, compared to when Mr Sarwar's party were in charge, when the money was so abundant they couldn't actually spend it, they only managed to, to build 5,448 houses. Now, Let's that hear says one another. Me, that says to me that this government is getting on with the job. Now, Mr Sarwar said to me, that this area of policy is all under the responsibility of the Scottish Government. And to an extent, that is true. Housing policy is our responsibility. But there is a budgetary question here. And let me just point out to Mr Sawa that our capital budget, which is what builds affordable homes, is facing a cut of near 9% under the current spending plans of the last Conservative Government, and the incoming Labour government that they're going to carry on with. Our financial transactions budget has been cut by a whopping 62%. Now, I have, raised, First Minister. I have raised with the Chancellor of the Exchequer and with the Deputy Prime Minister the absolute total stupidity and folly of presiding over a 62% cut in the financial transactions budget. So if Mr Sarwa would like to help Scotland in any way, shape or form, why doesn't he persuade the UK Labour government to desert the Tory agenda and to start investing in our country? Thank you. Question number three, Lorna Slater. This week is Climate Week. The Climate Change Committee tells us that we urgently need to decarbonise transport getting people out of cars and planes and onto buses, trains and their own feet and wheels. 
the Scottish Government's pilot to abolish peak rail fares, which was championed by the Scottish Greens in government, ends this week. Hiking up the prices of train fares for many workers and students who don't have any choice about when they travel. Is this the right message for the Scottish Government to be sending in Climate Week? First Minister. Uh, President officer, the Government has uh, invested in the pilot exercise. It was due to run for a six-month period. We extended it for a further six months, so there's been a, a year-long pilot to determine if this was an effective way to uh, deliver the modal shift, which I agree with Lorna Slater has got to happen, um, within the resources that we've got available. Now, unfortunately, what the, model sh what the pilot showed was that not, not, not enough difference had been made to the patterns of travel for the investment that was required, and we would need to find £40 million to continue with that exercise. Now, uh, I've gone through with Parliament on a number of occasions, and indeed the Finance Secretary did this a few weeks ago, the enormous challenges we're facing in the public finances. And uh, the, uh, however much we would wish to do the, um, take forward the peak fares pilot uh, into implementation, we simply don't have the resources to enable that to be the case for the scale of impact that the pilot identified. We have put in place other measures to discount fares to encourage uh, more travel by train, and we'll continue with those measures. Later. The First Minister is in luck because I have a suggestion for how he could raise that money. Oxfam has reported that £21.5 million a year, that's enough to abolish, abolish peak fares for good, could be raised through a tax on private jets assuming it was embedded in the air departure tax, legislation that this parliament passed seven years ago but hasn't acted on. Now, we all understand the need to ensure an exemption to air departure tax for our island communities. Will the First Minister work with the UK government to urgently introduce this tax so that commuters can once again have fair prices on our trains? First Minister. Well, I, 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 think, I think that's a very interesting and welcome suggestion that Lorna Slater makes. She's, 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 she's provided a, a complete explanation of the point because she recognises, as I do, the importance of securing an exemption for the Highlands and Islands from air departure tax, which, so I'm glad that there's a point of agreement there on that point. And as for taxing private jets, I would be you know, I'd be very much in the spirit of doing that. As Lorna Slater will realise, as will all members of Parliament realise, uh, we have to agree on the terms uh, of a budget. So uh, the Finance Secretary and I will be certainly happy to engage with all willing partners around the, par the, the Parliament on agreeing budget measures, and that includes my friends in the Green Party, it includes my friends in all parts of the parliamentary chamber uh, as, we, as, as, we, as, as, as we secure common ground. And, 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 in, and in the spirit Thank you. of and in the spirit of collaboration for which I am absolutely renowned, for in the spirit of collaboration for which I am renowned, I will happily take forward these issues with the United Kingdom government, with whom I am enjoying such collaborative and cooperative discussions just now. But they could go further on some other questions. Question number four, Emma Roddick. To ask the First Minister what discussions the Scottish Government is having with energy companies regarding a possible social tariff to reduce bills for low-income households. First Minister. Presiding officer, the Scottish Government has engaged with energy suppliers over recent weeks on the options available to reduce bills for households across Scotland. We are now establishing a working group to co-design a social tariff mechanism that would secure cross-sector support and demonstrate the viability and positive outcomes of the policy to the United Kingdom Government. The Government will consider eligible fuel types, consumer eligibility, regulatory environment, funding and delivery. Emma Roddick. I thank the First Minister for that answer. Despite Labour's pre-election promises, household energy prices are set to rise by £149 in October and 860,000 Scottish pensioners are to lose out on the winter fuel payment. So it is vital that the Scottish Government works on a social tariff to produce a fairer pricing model. Does the First Minister agree with me that these decisions from Westminster will disproportionately affect people living in Scotland, and in particular the Highlands and Islands, where the winters are much colder, and has he raised this with the UK Government? First Minister. 
Uh, President Officer, th these are very serious issues that Emma Roddick raises, uh, especially on behalf of her constituents in the Highlands and Islands, where, as she correctly indicates, the hardship of the decisions by the United Kingdom Government to end the universal winter fuel payments will have a particularly acute effect because of the differential temperatures that habitually exist in the Highlands and Islands. Um, so I do recognise these issues and these points have been raised by the Government with the United Kingdom Government because, as Emma Roddick will know, uh, this issue was essentially landed on the Scottish Government along with a budget cut of £160 million. Um, the work that we are undertaking on the co-design of a social tariff has been taken forward by the Minister for Climate Action, Dr Allen and uh, we're engaging with uh, relevant parties on that question. Obviously, this is a, an issue which uh, it, it requires United Kingdom government uh, um, agreement and, and, and engagement, and we will pursue that as a consequence of these discussions. Paul Kane. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, this is uh, an undoubtedly important issue. I'm sure after 17 years, another working group will be, uh, of course, widely welcomed. But I think it's clear that making work pay and accelerating the just transition are also vital components in reducing bills. And to do that, significant investment in renewables needs to come from the whole of the UK working together. And GB Energy, headquartered in Aberdeen, will play a crucial role in bringing down bills and delivering energy security. SNP MPs failed to vote for GB Energy recently. So will the First Minister confirm that a publicly owned energy generation company based in Aberdeen does have the support of this government? And what work is he doing in that renewed, uh, constructive relationship with UK ministers in order to move these issues forward? First Minister. I could almost have suggested that Mr O'Keane is a planted question to allow me <laughs> to talk of the, the virtues of my collaboration with the United Kingdom government, which I will happily do so. Uh, last Thursday evening, I had the pleasure and the generosity of uh, time given to me by the chair of GB Energy, uh, Jürgen Meyer, who came to meet me on Thursday evening uh, with the Climate Change Secretary, Net Zero Secretary, I should say. Uh, we spent several hours discussing the plans of GB Energy, and uh, Jürgen Meyer came to the Scottish Energy Advisory Board, which I chair with uh, a Principal Sir Jim Macdonald of the University of Strathclyde on Friday morning to further discuss the issues with a much wider range of stakeholders. The one thing I'm absolutely certain about is that GB Energy is not going to be an, an energy generation company anytime soon. Yeah. I'm absolutely convinced of that. It might be a helpful vehicle in arranging and collaborating on investment proposals, and we will happily engage on that, but I really don't think Mr O'Kane can sustain the line of argument that GB Energy is going to be an energy generator because it ain't going to be that any time soon. Yeah. We will work with GB Energy. We've had constructive discussions. We've got a lot of projects that are already in the pipeline. We're supporting them with investment from the Scottish National Investment Bank. If there's other investment support from GB Energy or the National Wealth Fund, we will welcome that and we will work collaboratively to, provide, to produce a good outcome for Scotland. Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, President. Officer. I was listening to the interaction between Emma Roddick and the First Minister there around uh, uh, energy bills and, and raising of energy bills. And it strikes me that there, there are we could get agreement across this chamber that are those in our communities who are housebound, potentially disabil with disabilities, who have high levels of energy use. Potentially, First Minister, aren't those the first people we should be supporting? First Minister. I, th I think Mr. Mr. Whittle raises a, a, a really important issue because. He highlights the fact that there will be individuals who are not on particularly high incomes that are just above the pension credit threshold, which is not a very high income. Uh, somebody on an income of about £12,000, if my memory serves me right, will be above the pension credit threshold and could be in the situation that Mr Whittle raises of having very high energy use because of their physical condition or the, their, their, their needs. And they will not be eligible for a winter fuel payment. That's why the, the universality has been important to date. So I'm sympathetic to exploring what more we can do to help individuals, but I'm sure Mr Whittle will understand the difficulty I face, that we have had an abrupt removal of £160 million from our public finances, which prevent us from delivering a universal benefit, much as I would like to do so. Question number five, Pam Gossel. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister whether the Scottish Government plans to embed domestic abuse experts in 999 control rooms similar to plans announced by the UK Government for England and Wales. First Minister. Presiding Officer, Police Scotland's contact assessment model already ensures that people receive the support and safeguarding they need in a timely fashion when they are in contact with control rooms. This is primarily an operational matter for Police Scotland, but we will be interested in how the pilot proposals develop and will want to see the outcomes and benefits that this would bring to victims of domestic abuse, which is of paramount importance to us. Also. I thank the First Minister for that response. Police Scotland responds to domestic abuse calls every nine minutes. That is every nine minutes a potential victim is in need of urgent assistance. It is worth examining if domestic abuse experts in 999 control rooms would make a difference. But I have also put forward proposals in my United Against Violence paper to expand training so that, so that all frontline public sector workers can understand and spot the warning signs of domestic yeah. abuse. Will the First Minister consider introducing such a scheme like that? First Minister. Uh, I, I, I know that the Justice Secretary met with Pam Gosal um, on this and other questions yesterday, and I am very interested in the proposals that she brings forward. I think we need to do all that we possibly can do to ensure that those who experience domestic abuse are able to receive the support that they require. It, you know, it should be stated that domestic violence should not be happening in any circumstance whatsoever, uh, but where it happens, we should provide the support. So I'm open to discussing the issues that Pam Gosell puts to me today. Rona Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome the legislative proposals within the Criminal Justice Modernisation and Abusive Domestic Behaviour Reviews Bill published yesterday that can help prevent domestic violence. But would the First Minister agree with me that it is only by changing social attitudes and specific behaviours of those that perpetrate domestic violence, the vast majority of whom are men, that we can truly see a, differing, a difference in reducing domestic and gender-based violence? Minister. I agree with Rona Mackay. Uh, those who perpetrate violence and abuse, um, the majority of whom are men, must change their actions and behaviour, and we must root out and tackle uh, the culture, the toxic masculinity culture and gender inequality that leads to violence, harassment, misogyny and abuse against women. We should stand against it and we should call it out wherever we see it. Um, our equally safe strategy is aimed at preventing and eradicating violence against women and girls, and the legislative proposals in the Criminal Justice Modernisation and Abusive Domestic Behaviour Review Bills are designed to help us in that process. But I'm also uh, uh, very keen to make sure that we work across this chamber to capture some of the thinking that Pam Gosell has put to me uh, to make sure that we do everything we can to address this scourge in our society. Question number six, Pauline McNeill. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's responses to reports regarding the number of young people aged 11 to 14 who are involved in violent crime. First Minister. President of, sir, the Government is concerned that any increase in violent behaviour involving young people, particularly after so many years of decline. Since 2006 7, we have seen a 74 per cent reduction in the number of children referred to the Children's Reporter on offence grounds. And more generally, for adults, we have seen non-sexual violent crime falling by 58 per cent since 2008-9, according to the last Scottish Crime and Justice Survey. Um, our violence prevention framework is delivering a number of key actions for young people, including the recent uh, Quit Fighting for Likes campaign to prevent the filming and sharing of violent incidents on social media. Police Scotland data indicates that almost 14,000 violent crimes were committed by children in 2023-24. But worryingly, there is a sharp rise in this age group, 11 to 14, armed with weapons such as knives, blunt objects and bottles. And knives were the most common weapon used or present. Concerning the Chief Constable told the Criminal Justice Committee last week that the number of assaults on police officers by under-18s is on the increase. So, does the First Minister firstly acknowledge that cuts to youth services could have made this problem worse? I mean, the lack of availability on data has been criticised by YouthLink and other organisations. So, I'd like to ask the First Minister what exactly are they doing to engage with this age group, given the severity of these crimes? Because, in the face of it, it doesn't appear you're doing much at all. First Minister. 
Presiding officer, there are a number of steps that are taken by the government. Indeed, we have invested more than £4 million in the last two years to implement the actions that are set out in the violence prevention framework. Um, we work with a range of partners, including Youth Link Scotland that Polly McNeill referred to, who deliver our National No Knives Better Lives programme. Um, we also work with the Scottish Violence Reduction Unit, who have got a formidable track record on the tackling of knife crime and violent crime and medics against <coughs> violence. But I don't say any of that to in any way suggest that there is not a serious issue that has to be confronted here. There is a range of measures the Government can take. We can obviously work with partners. Um, I met over the summer with um, a brave young person who has been very much involved in the Daily Records campaign, uh, Our Kids, Our Future, and I warmly commend that young person um, and the Daily Record for the work that they have brought forward. I committed in that conversation to draw together representatives of all political parties to reflect on what more we could do to tackle this issue, and that is an issue that will be taken forward. And knowing, knowing the deep interest that Polly McNeill has in this subject, uh, I would welcome her participation in that cross-party summit. Thank you. We will move to constituency and general supplementaries, and I call Emma Harper. Thank you, President Officer. This week is Organ Donation Week, and it's an opportunity to encourage people across Scotland to make their organ donation wishes known and explain the importance of sharing a person's organ donation decision with loved ones so that choice can be honoured. I say this as a former liver transplant team nurse. Could the First Minister provide an update on what action the Scottish Government is taking to promote the importance of organ donation and the importance of people making their wishes known? First Minister. Uh, President Officer, we have a, a range of awareness campaigns that are in place to encourage individuals to uh, take the steps that Emma Harper has set out. This is important life-saving activity that can involve us all, and I would use this opportunity at uh, question time uh, to make it clear the Government's support for the aspirations set out in Emma Harper's question. Alexander Stewart. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's reaction is to the findings of the New Health Organisation study, which found Scottish 13 year old girls displaying addictive behaviours towards social media and boys the same age showing the highest levels of daily gaming? And how does it plan to manage this potentially dangerous and damaging behaviour? First Minister. Uh, I, I think this, this is a serious issue, and um, as the father of a 13 year old, I wrestle with these challenges on a constant basis. Um, so I, I, and I say that in all seriousness about the degree of um, focus there is on social media amongst young people. We have got to encourage young people to, uh, to, to see social media activity in perspective in the rest of their activities, so encouraging um, uh, healthy, active lifestyles is important too. Uh, next week is Women and Girls in Sport Week, and uh, the Government is engaged in a lot of promotional work to encourage um, more participation and engagement in sporting activity by women and girls. Indeed, I will be visiting um, Perth College UHI um, uh, in Perth City um, to support some of this work next week. So I, I think we have got to encourage awareness raising of the dangers of um, social media and its overuse. Um, Parliament has already discussed some of the very acute dangers in the question that was put to me by Evelyn Tweed some months ago about the tragic case in Dunblane. And um, we have to make sure that there is wide understanding of the difficulties and the challenges that can arise from overuse of social media. Jackie Bailey. I have been contacted by Alan Ronald, who is a type 1 diabetic. Last month, he visited more than six different pharmacies before eventually getting insulin in Glasgow. Yesterday, he was told at his diabetic clinic that there are only four vials left in Glasgow. So you can imagine his distress. Can the First Minister advise what urgent steps are being taken to address this acute shortage of insulin? First Minister. Um, the, this is a very important issue, and I, I recognise the importance of individuals being able to um, uh, have access to insulin supplies. Uh, procurement is undertaken on a United Kingdom wide basis. Um, I am not familiar with the challenges that uh, Jackie Bailey puts to me about supply and circulation. I will look into that in the aftermath of First Minister's question time because it is critical that individuals who rely upon that supply are able to obtain it. Uh, and I will write to Jackie Bailey with an update uh, later today. Adam. 
Thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister, in light of this being, <coughs> excuse me, in light of this being International Week of Deaf People, how the Scottish Government is ensuring that Scotland is the best place for deaf people to live, work, learn, and visit. First Minister. Well, first of all, I, I want to start by commending my friend and colleague Karen Adam for the tremendous leadership she offers in this area of uh, policy. She's a champion of the deaf community and raises these issues assiduously. Um, our efforts are underpinned by our See Hear strategy that was a product of partnership working with local authorities, health boards and the third sector. See Hear funding is used through localised sensory support partnerships, which include the third sector, to help put supports in place for deaf people. And I commend their activity and I commend Karen Adam for the leadership that she shows on this matter. Finlay Carson. Thank you, President Officer. In a response to my letter to the Prime Minister, I understand that the Department of Transport are still in discussions with His Majesty's Treasury regarding the £8 million committed by the former Prime Minister Rishi Shunak to fund a study on A75. I'm also aware that the Secretary for State for Transport has met with the Cabinet Secretary to discuss shared transport priorities. Will the First Minister update members on any progress being made and confirm his commitment to working with the UK Government to deliver the much-needed bypasses for Crockett Ford and Spring Home? And will the First Minister also agree to meet with me and the South West Scotland Transport Alliance to consider their calls to form a task force to deliver these urgent uh, improvements? First Minister. President Officer, let me say that, first of all, that uh, we will engage constructively with the United Kingdom Government on this question. Uh, I know the importance of the issue to Mr Carson and his constituents, so we will engage constructively on that basis. Um, I'd be very happy to meet with Mr Carson and his local campaigners to discuss the improvements to the A75 and to take forward that dialogue. Uh, indeed, it might be uh, beneficial if I came down to, uh, to Galloway to have that conversation um, to, to do so. And finally, um, presiding officer, th there is, uh, I, I am aware of there being quite a bit of uncertainty about the funding for particular projects that many of us believed were in the course of being delivered because of the upcoming budget process and the spending review. And indeed, there are a number of projects that I'm aware of where the, where the United Kingdom government is not at this stage able to make the commit or to honour the commitments that had been previously given by the previous government. Uh, so we'll obviously, uh, and obviously Mr Carson will appreciate that's not an issue under my control, but I will engage constructively, as I know the Finance Secretary is doing so, with the Treasury on these points. And uh, we can perhaps discuss some of these uh, when I meet with Mr Carson and his constituents. Ben McPherson. Officer, I am aware that the latest recently published Global Financial Centres Index has recognised that Edinburgh continues to further its standing as one of the world's leading financial centres. This is good news for all of Scotland, as is Glasgow's success in climbing up through the rankings as well. Therefore, can I ask the First Minister to provide an update on how Scottish Government initiatives are supporting financial services in Scotland to thrive and develop, creating new opportunities, well-paid jobs and sustainable growth? Minister. Uh, President Officer, there is a formidable amount of work going on in this area and uh, just the other day on Tuesday evening I had the pleasure to address the um, Ethical Finance Global Summit Dinner uh, which took place in Edinburgh where there was a very extensive range of investors who had come to Scotland for a three-day summit on green ethical uh, investments um, uh, and it was a tremendous showcase opportunity for the government to engage with. The Deputy First Minister uh, launched uh, and responded to, to the report of the Scottish Task Force for Green and Sustainable Financial Services on Wednesday. And the Minister for Business opened the new FinTech wing at the Edinburgh Futures Institute and marked the launch of the FinTech Scotland Festival. Now, I cite all of that activity because it's indicative of the energy that the government is putting into securing investment and the Green Ethical Finance Initiative has been an initiative um, which has been many years in the gestation, um, but we are now beginning to see the fruits of that activity as a consequence of the sustained focus and leadership of ministers in this government. So I'm delighted to see the progress that's been made. The transformation and position for, um, uh, for Glasgow in the rankings has been significant, also for Edinburgh, and it demonstrates the strength of the Scottish financial services sector, of which we should be enormously proud. 
and Foisal Chowdhury. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Following warning Scotland faces a cultural recession, it was reported that Creative Scotland and the Scottish Government were in talks over the immediate future of arts organisations. With decisions on multi-year funding only weeks away, will the First Minister reassure arts organisations and confirm where funding for Creative Scotland to make these long-term decisions will be released and how large their budget will be? First Minister. There, uh, I'm enormously sympathetic to uh, financial support for the artistic and cultural sector in Scotland. It is absolutely fundamental that we have uh, stable and supportive financial arrangements in place for the sector. The operational challenge that we have, of course, is that the Scottish Government does not know what its budget is going to be for the next financial year. That is a decision which will be influenced significantly by the Chancellor's budget on the 30th of October. So what the Government has got to wrestle with is the challenge of providing assurance when it itself does not have assurance from the United Kingdom Government. Now that's nobody's fault, that's just timing. But the one thing I want to say absolutely crystal clear to Parliament today is that the Scottish Government will support the cultural sector to fulfil its potential in Scotland. It is part of our essential identity as a country. The government will stand behind the sector and we simply have to make sure we have the practical assurance in place to make sure we can give the financial commitments that Mr Chowdhury seeks from me today and which I quite understand the cultural sector require to hear from us. Uh, but we are focusing very much on that question and the Culture Secretary, Angus Robertson, is engaged in discussions with Creative Scotland on the best way to navigate our way through those challenges. Thank you. Point of order, Douglas Ross. Yeah, I, I'm grateful, uh, Presiding Officer. In his response to me, the First Minister wanted to put on record, and I use his words, levels of crime in Scotland are currently at 40-year lows. But we already have a record. It's the Scottish Government's own statistics published this summer that said crime in Scotland from 2022 to 2023 to 23-24 rose by 4%. So how could the crime levels be at their lowest level for 40 years when the Scottish Government's own figures say they have increased? Mr now, Ross, if I might stop you there, you will be aware that points of order are to be used to address whether proper procedures are or have been followed. And they are not to continue debates. They are not to question whether... You, you know, the member will be aware that there is a mechanism to address inaccurate comments. There, so I'm, I'm very interested to understand what the point of order is. Therefore, can I ask you, Presiding Officer, if, given the Justice Secretary has been sat next to the First Minister today and the First Minister had this information available, what remedies does the First Minister have at his disposal to update Parliament if he has deliberately or inadvertently misled Parliament on this important issue? I would simply repeat again that points of order refer to whether proper procedures have been followed. The content of members' contributions is a matter for members, and members will be aware of the mechanism that exists to address any inaccuracies. First Minister's questions is concluded. The next item of business is a members' business debate in the name of Rona Mackay, and there will now be a short suspension to allow the chamber and gallery to clear. <laughs>